The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, and John Rudd. Julian the Apostate Becomes Emperor of Rome, A.D. 360, by Edward Gibbon, Part 1. The great reign of Constantine was ended. The new capital, Constantinople, which after 15 centuries still perpetuates the name of its imperial founder, had outrivaled Rome. The heirs of Constantine, the sons of Fausta, had all been called Caesar and were appointed to succeed to imperial power. Constantine, Constantius, and Constance they were named. They held court in different parts of the realm during their father's life, although he reserved for himself the title of Augustus. The last years of his reign of thirty years had been peaceful, disturbed only by the insurrection in Cyprus and the wars of the Goths and Sarmatians. And so he died, and the purple and diadem were but empty symbols, and he lay in state upon his golden bed, the great emperor was no sooner dead than the sons made haste to rid themselves of all possible rivals in a family that seemed too numerous for peace. Two uncles and seven cousins were quickly put out of the way, under one pretense and another. The provinces were divided between the three brothers, and they reigned peacefully for three years, until Constantine demanded the surrender to him of a part of the dominions of Constance. In the war which ensued, Constantine was killed, and Constance took possession of his brother's provinces, refusing any share of them to Constantius. He reigned ten years longer, when he was destroyed, A.D. 350, by a conspiracy in Gaul, headed by one Magnentius. This soldier of barbarian extraction was soon defeated by Constantius, who now became sole emperor. He soon found his burden of power too great, and decided to share it with the two young nephews who had been permitted to live when the massacre of the house of Constantine occurred. To Gallus the elder, he gave the title of Caesar, and invested him with the government of the East. Gallus conducted himself like a Nero, and was disgraced and executed about three years later. The younger nephew, Julian, had been brought up in the Christian faith and received an excellent education, which was finished in the philosophical schools of Athens. He was created Caesar by Constantius, whose sister Helena he married, and was invested with the government of Gaul, Spain, and Britain. Julian's wise civil administration was very acceptable to the people and his brilliant military exploits established his fame throughout the empire and won the affection of his soldiers. He repulsed the Alamans and the Franks, sending captives to the court of Constantius. His expeditions beyond the Rhine were crowned with success. He restored the cities of Gaul and stemmed the tide of barbarian invasion. All these triumphs had awakened the jealousy of the emperor Constantius who was practically ruled by the eunuchs and bishops at his court. The rising fortunes of Julian had caused envy among many who set about to poison the mind of Constantius with innuendos and false suggestions. They resolved to disarm Julian and to separate him from his army. The emperor ordered Julian to send his best troops to the war in Persia. But they forgot that the troops adored Julian, they overlooked the fact that the soldiers would see through such a scheme to humiliate their commander. The Gauls also feared the departure of Julian's men, for they dreaded the attacks of the Germans. This, then, was the situation. Julian attempted to follow the orders of the emperor, but fate ordained otherwise. The army proclaimed him emperor. He refused the honor at first, but was forced to assume the dangerous title. The war which immediately followed was cut short by the sudden death of Constantius, and Julian became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. He renounced Christianity and is known in history as Julian the Apostate. 
While the Romans languished under the ignominious tyranny of eunuchs and bishops, the praises of Julian were repeated with transport in every part of the empire, except in the palace of Constantius. The barbarians of Germany had felt and still dreaded the arms of the young Caesar. His soldiers were the companions of his victory. The grateful provincials enjoyed the blessings of his reign, but the favorites, who had opposed his elevation, were offended by his virtues, and they justly considered the friend of the people as the enemy of the court. As long as the fame of Julian was doubtful, the buffoons in the palace who were skilled in the language of satire tried the efficacy of those arts which they had so often practiced with success. They easily discovered that his simplicity was not exempt from affectation. The ridiculous epithets of a hairy savage, of an ape invested with the purple, were applied to the dress and person of the philosophic warrior, and his modest dispatches were stigmatized as the vain and elaborate fictions of a loquacious Greek, a speculative soldier who had studied the art of war amid the groves of the academy. The voice of malicious folly was at length silenced by the shouts of victory. The conqueror of the Franks and Elamani could no longer be painted as an object of contempt, and the monarch himself was meanly ambitious of stealing from his lieutenant the honorable reward of his labors. In the letters crowned with laurel, which, according to ancient custom, were addressed to the provinces, the name of Julian was omitted. Constantius had made his dispositions in person. He had signalized his valor in the foremost ranks. His military conduct had secured the victory, and the captive king of the barbarians was presented to him on the field of battle, from which he was at that time distant about forty days' journey. So extravagant a fable was incapable, however, of deceiving the public credulity or even of satisfying the pride of the emperor himself. Secretly conscious that the applause and favor of the Romans accompanied the rising fortunes of Julian, his discontented mind was prepared to receive the subtle poisons of those artful sycophants, who colored their mischievous designs with the fairest appearances of truth and candor. Instead of depreciating the merits of Julian, they acknowledged and even exaggerated his popular fame, superior talents, and important services. But they darkly insinuated that the virtues of the Caesar might instantly be converted into the most dangerous crimes if the inconstant multitude should prefer their inclinations to their duty, or if the general of a victorious army should be tempted from his allegiance by the hopes of revenge and independent greatness. The personal fears of Constantius were interpreted by his council as a laudable anxiety for the public safety, while in private, and perhaps in his own breast, he disguised, under the less odious appellation of fear, the sentiments of hatred and envy, which he had secretly conceived for the inimitable virtues of Julian. The apparent tranquillity of Gaul and the imminent danger of the eastern provinces offered a specious pretense for the design which was artfully concerted by the imperial ministers. They resolved to disarm the Caesar, to recall those faithful troops who guarded his person and dignity, and to employ, in a distant war against the Persian monarch, the hardy veterans who had vanquished, on the banks of the Rhine, the fiercest nations of Germany. While Julian used the laborious hours of his winter quarters at Paris in the administration of power, which in his hands was the exercise of virtue, he was surprised by the hasty arrival of a tribune and a notary, with positive orders from the emperor, which they were directed to execute, and he was commanded not to oppose. Constantius signified his pleasure that four entire legions, the Celtiae, the Petulants, the Heruli and the Batavians should be separated from the standard of Julian, under which they had acquired their fame and discipline, that in each of the remaining bands three hundred of the bravest youths should be selected, and that this numerous detachment, the strength of the Gallic army, should instantly begin their march, 
and exert their utmost diligence to arrive before the opening of the campaign on the frontiers of Persia. Caesar foresaw and lamented the consequences of this fatal mandate. Most of the auxiliaries who engaged their voluntary service had stipulated that they should never oblige to pass the Alps. The public faith of Rome and the personal honor of Julian had been pledged for the observance of this condition. Such an act of treachery and oppression would destroy the confidence and excite the resentment of the independent warriors of Germany, who considered truth as the noblest of their virtues, and freedom as the most valuable of their possessions. The legionnaires who enjoyed the title and privileges of Romans were enlisted for the general defense of the Republic, but those mercenary troops heard with cold indifference the antiquated names of the Republic and of Rome. Attached either from birth or long habit to the climate and manners of Gaul, they loved and admired Julian. They despised and perhaps hated the emperor. They dreaded the laborious march, the Persian arrows, and the burning deserts of Asia. They claimed as their own the country which they had saved and excused their want of spirit by pleading the sacred and more immediate duty of protecting their families and friends. The apprehensions of the Gauls were derived from the knowledge of the impending and inevitable danger. As soon as the provinces were exhausted of their military strength, the Germans would violate a treaty which had been imposed on their fears. And notwithstanding the abilities and valor of Julian, the general of a nominal army, to whom the public calamities would be imputed, must find himself, after a vain resistance, either a prisoner in the camp of the barbarians or a criminal in the palace of Constantius. If Julian complied with the orders which he had received, he subscribed his own destruction, that of a people who deserved his affection. But a positive refusal was an act of rebellion and a declaration of war. The inexorable jealousy of the emperor, the preemptory and perhaps insidious nature of his commands, left not any room for a fair apology or candid interpretation, and the dependent station of the Caesar scarcely allowed him to pause or to deliberate. Solitude increased the perplexity of Julian. He could no longer apply to the faithful counsels of Sallust, who had been removed from his office by the judicious malice of the eunuchs. He could not even enforce his representations by the concurrence of the ministers, who would have been afraid or ashamed to approve the ruin of Gaul. The moment had been chosen when Lupicinus, the general of the cavalry, was dispatched into Britain to repulse the inroads of the Scots and Picts, and Florentius, who occupied at Vienna by the assessment of the tribute. The latter, a crafty and corrupt statesman, declining to assume a responsible part on this dangerous occasion, eluded the pressing and repeated invitations of Julian, who represented to him that in every important measure the presence of the prefect was indispensable in the council of the prince. In the meanwhile, the Caesar was oppressed by the rude and importunate solicitations of the imperial messengers, who presumed to suggest that if he expected the return of his ministers, he would charge himself with the guilt of the delay and reserve for them the merit of the execution. Unable to resist, unwilling to comply, Julian expressed in the most serious terms his wish and even his intention of resigning the purple, which he could not preserve with honor, but which he could not abdicate with safety. After a painful conflict, Julian was compelled to acknowledge that obedience was the virtue of the most eminent subject, and that the sovereign alone was entitled to judge to the public welfare. He issued the necessary orders for carrying into execution the commands of Constantius, a part of the troops began their march for the Alps, and the detachments from the several garrisons moved toward their respective places of assembly. They advanced with difficulty through the trembling and affrighted crowds of provincials who attempted to excite their pity by silent despair or loud lamentations, while the wives of the soldiers, holding their infants in their arms, accused the desertion of their husbands 
in the mixed language of grief, of tenderness, and of indignation. This scene of general distress afflicted the humanity of the Caesar. He granted a sufficient number of post wagons to transport the wives and families of the soldiers, endeavored to alleviate the hardships which he was constrained to inflict, and increased by the most laudable arts his own popularity and the discontent of the exiled troops. The grief of an armed multitude is soon converted into rage. Their licentious murmurs, which every hour were communicated from tent to tent with more boldness and effect, prepared their minds for the most daring acts of sedition. And by the connivance of their tribunes, a seasonable libel was secretly dispersed, which painted in lively colors the disgrace of the Caesar, the oppression of the Gallic army, and the feeble vices of the tyrant of Asia. The servants of Constantius were astonished and alarmed by the progress of this dangerous spirit. They pressed the Caesar to hasten the departure of the troops, but they imprudently rejected the honest and judicious advice of Julian, who proposed that they should not march through Paris and suggested the danger and temptation of a last interview. As soon as the approach of the troops was announced, the Caesar went out to meet them and ascended his tribunal which had been erected in a plain before the gates of the city. After distinguishing the officers and soldiers who by their rank or merit deserved a peculiar attention, Julian addressed himself in a studied oration to the surrounding multitude. He celebrated their exploits with grateful applause, encouraged them to accept with alacrity the honor of serving under the eyes of a powerful and liberal monarch, and admonished them that the commands of Augustus required an instant and cheerful obedience. The soldiers who were apprehensive of offending their general by an indecent clamor, or of belying their sentiments by false and venal acclamations, maintained an obstinate silence, and after a short pause were dismissed to their quarters. The principal officers were entertained by the Caesar, who professed, in the warmest language of friendship, his desire and his inability to reward, according to their deserts, the brave companions of his victories. They retired from the feast, full of grief and perplexity, and lamented the hardship of their fate, which tore them from their beloved general and their native country. The only expedient which could prevent their separation was boldly agitated and approved. The popular resentment was insensibly molded into a regular conspiracy. Their just reasons of complaint were heightened by passion, and their passion was inflamed by wine. As on the eve of their departure, the troops were indulged in licentious festivity. At the hour of midnight, the impetuous multitude, with swords and bows and torches in their hands, rushed into the suburbs, encompassed the palace, and, careless of future dangers, pronounced the fatal and irrevocable words, Julian Augustus. The prince, whose anxious suspense was interrupted by their disorderly acclamations, secured the doors against their intrusion, and, as long as it was in his power, secluded his person in dignity from the accidents of a nocturnal tumult. At the dawn of the day, the soldiers, whose zeal was irritated by opposition, forcibly entered the palace, seized with respectful violence the object of their choice, guarded Julian with drawn swords through the streets of Paris, placed him on the tribunal, and with repeated shouts saluted him as their emperor. Prudence, as well as loyalty, inculcated the propriety of resisting their treasonable designs, and of preparing, for his oppressed virtue, the excuse of violence. Addressing himself by turns to the multitude and to individuals, he sometimes implored their mercy, and sometimes expressed his indignation, conjured them not to sully the fame of their immortal victories, and ventured to promise that if they would immediately return to their allegiance, he would undertake to obtain from the emperor not only a free and gracious pardon, but even the revocation of the orders which had excited their resentment. But the soldiers, who were conscious of their guilt, 
chose rather to depend on the gratitude of Julian than on the clemency of the emperor. Their zeal was insensibly turned into impatience, and their impatience into rage. The inflexible Caesar sustained, till the third hour of the day, their prayers, their reproaches, and their menaces. Nor did he yield till he had been repeatedly assured that if he wished to live he must consent to reign. He was exalted on a shield in the presence and amid the unanimous acclamations of the troops. A rich military collar, which was offered by chance, supplied the want of a diadem. The ceremony was concluded by the promise of a moderate donative, and the new emperor, overwhelmed with real or affected grief, retired into the most secret recesses of his apartment. The grief of Julian could proceed only from his innocence, but his innocence must appear extremely doubtful in the eyes of those who have learned to suspect the motives and the professions of princes. His lively and active mind was susceptible of the various impressions of hope and fear, of gratitude and revenge, of duty and of ambition, of the love of fame, and of the fear of reproach. But it is impossible for us to calculate the respective weight and operation of these sentiments, or to ascertain the principles of action which might escape the observation, while they guided, or rather impelled, the steps of Julian himself. The discontent of the troops was produced by the malice of his enemies. Their tumult was the natural effect of interest and of passion, and if Julian had tried to conceal a deep design under the appearances of chance, he must have employed the most consummate artifice without necessity, and probably without success. He solemnly declares in the presence of Jupiter, of the Sun, of Mars, of Minerva, and of all the other deities, that till the close of the evening, which preceded his elevation, he was utterly ignorant of the designs of the soldiers. And it may seem ungenerous to distrust the honor of a hero and the truth of a philosopher. Yet the superstitious confidence that Constantius was the enemy and that he himself was the favorite of the gods might prompt him to desire, to solicit, and even to hasten the auspicious moment of his reign, which was predestined to restore the ancient religion of mankind. When Julian had received the intelligence of the conspiracy, he resigned himself to a short slumber, and afterward related to his friends that he had seen the genius of the empire waiting with some impatience at his door, pressing for admittance and reproaching his want of spirit and ambition. Astonished and perplexed, he addressed his prayers to the great Jupiter, who immediately signified by a clear and manifest omen that he should submit to the will of heaven and of the army. The conduct which disclaims the ordinary maxims of reason excites our suspicion and eludes our inquiry. Whenever the spirit of fanaticism, at once so credulous and so crafty, has insinuated itself into a noble mind, it insensibly corrodes the vital principles of virtue and veracity. To moderate the zeal of his party, to protect the persons of his enemies, to defeat and to despise the secret enterprises which were formed against his life and dignity, were the cares which employed the first days of his reign of the new emperor. Although he was firmly resolved to maintain the station which he had assumed, he was still desirous of saving his country from the calamities of civil war, of declining a contest with the superior forces of Constantius, and of preserving his own character from the reproach of perfidy and ingratitude. Adorned with the ensigns of military and imperial pomp, Julian showed himself in the field of Mars to the soldiers, who glowed with ardent enthusiasm in the cause of their pupil, their leader, and their friend. He recapitulated their victories, lamented their sufferings, applauded their resolution, animated their hopes, and checked their impetuosity. Nor did he dismiss the assembly till he had obtained a solemn promise from the troops. 
that if the emperor of the East would subscribe an equitable treaty, they would renounce any views of conquest and satisfy themselves with the tranquil possession of the Gallic provinces. On this foundation, he composed in his own name and in that of the army a specious and moderate epistle, which was delivered to Pendatius, his master of the offices, and to his chamberlain Eutherius, two ambassadors whom he appointed to receive the answer and observe the disposition of Constantius. The epistle is inscribed with a modest appellation of Caesar, but Julian solicits in a peremptory, though respectful manner, the confirmation of the title of Augustus. He acknowledges the irregularity of his own election, while he justifies, in some measure, the resentment and violence of the troops which had extorted his reluctant consent. He allows the supremacy of his brother Constantius and engages to send him an annual present of Spanish horses to recruit his army with a select number of barbarian youths and to accept from his choice a praetorian prefect of approved discretion and fidelity. But he reserves for himself the nomination of his other civil and military officers with the troops, the revenue, and the sovereignty of the provinces beyond the Alps. He admonishes the emperor to consult the dictates of justice, to distrust the arts of those venal flatterers who subsist only by the discord of princes, and to embrace the offer of a fair and honorable treaty, equally advantageous to the Republic and the House of Constantine. In this negotiation, Julian claimed no more than he already possessed. The delegated authority which he had long exercised over the provinces of Gaul, Spain, and Britain was still obeyed under a name more independent and august. The soldiers and the people rejoiced in a revolution which was not stained even by the blood of the guilty. Florentius was a fugitive, Lupicinus a prisoner. The persons who were disaffected to the new government were disarmed and secured, and the vacant offices were distributed according to the recommendation of merit by a prince who despised the intrigues of the palace and the clamors of the soldiers. The negotiations of peace were accompanied and supported by the most vigorous preparations for war. The army, which Julian held in readiness for immediate action, was recruited and augmented by the disorders of the times. The cruel persecution of the faction of Magnentius had filled Gaul with numerous bands of outlaws and robbers. They cheerfully accepted the offer of a general pardon from a prince whom they could trust, submitted to the restraints of military discipline, and retained only their implacable hatred to the person and government of Constantius. End of section 34. Julian the Apostate Becomes Emperor of Rome, A.D. 360, by Edward Gibbon, Part 2. As soon as the season of the year permitted Julian to take the field, he appeared at the head of his legions, threw a bridge over the Rhine in the neighborhood of Cleves, and prepared to chastise the perfidy of the Atori, a tribe of Franks, who presumed that they might ravage with impunity the frontiers of a divided empire. The difficulty as well as glory of this enterprise consisted in a laborious march, and Julian had conquered as soon as he could penetrate into a country which former princes had considered as inaccessible. After he had given peace to the barbarians, the emperor carefully visited the fortifications along the Rhine, from Cleves to Basel, surveyed with particular attention the territories which he had recovered from the hands of the Alemanni, passed through Besanchon, which had severely suffered from their fury, and fixed his headquarters at Vienna for the ensuing winter. The barrier of Gaul was improved and strengthened with additional fortifications, and Julian entertained some hopes that the Germans, whom he had so often vanquished, might in his absence be restrained by the terror of his name. Vadomer was the only prince of the Alemanni whom he esteemed or feared and while a subtle barbarian affected to observe the faith of treaties, the progress of his arms threatened the state with an unseasonable and dangerous war. 
the policy of Julian condescended to surprise the prince of the Alemanni by his own arts. And Vadomir, who, in the character of a friend, had incautiously accepted an invitation from the Roman governors, was seized in the midst of the entertainment and sent away prisoner into the heart of Spain. Before the barbarians were recovered from their amazement, the emperor appeared in arms on the banks of the Rhine, and, once more crossing the river, renewed the deep impression of terror and respect which had been already made by four preceding expeditions. The ambassadors of Julian had been instructed to execute with the utmost diligence their important commission, but in their passage through Italy and Illyricum, they were detained by the tedious and affected delays of the provincial governors. They were conducted by slow journeys from Constantinople to Caesarea in Cappadocia, and when at length they were admitted to the presence of Constantius, they found that he had already conceived, from the dispatches of his own officers, the most unfavorable opinion of the conduct of Julian and of the Gallic army. The letters were heard with impatience. The trembling messengers were dismissed with indignation and contempt, and the looks, the gestures, the furious language of the monarch expressed the disorder of his soul. The domestic connection which might have reconciled the brother and the husband of Helena was recently dissolved by the death of that princess whose pregnancy had been several times fruitless, and was at last fatal to herself. The Empress Eusebia had preserved to the last moment of her life the warm and even jealous affection which she had conceived for Julian, and her mild influence might have moderated the resentment of a prince who, since her death, was abandoned to his own passions and to the arts of his eunuchs. But the terror of a foreign invasion obliged him to suspend the punishment of a private enemy. He continued his march toward the confines of Persia, and thought it sufficient to signify the conditions which might entitle Julian and his guilty followers to the clemency of their offended sovereign. He required that the presumptuous Caesar should expressly renounce the appellation and rank of Augustus, which he had accepted from the rebels that he should descend to his former station of a limited and dependent minister, that he should vest the powers of the state and army in the hands of those officers who were appointed by the imperial court, and that he should trust his safety to the assurances of pardon, which were announced by Epictetus, a Gallic bishop, and one of the Arian favorites of Constantius. Several months were ineffectually consumed in a treaty which was negotiated at the distance of 3,000 miles between Paris and Antioch. And as soon as Julian perceived that his modest and respectful behavior served only to irritate the pride of an implacable adversary, he boldly resolved to commit his life and fortune to the chance of a civil war. He gave a public and military audience to the quester Leonis, the haughtily epistle of Constantius, was read to the attentive multitude, and Julian protested with the most flattering deference that he was ready to resign the title of Augustus if he could obtain the consent of those whom he acknowledged as the authors of his elevation. The faint proposal was impetuously silenced, and the acclamations of Julian Augustus continue to reign by the authority of the army of the people of the republic which you have saved thundered at once from every part of the field, and terrified the pale ambassador of Constantius. A part of the letter was afterward read, in which the emperor arraigned the ingratitude of Julian, whom he had invested with the honors of the purple, whom he had educated with so much care and tenderness, whom he had preserved in his infancy when he was left a helpless orphan. An orphan, interrupted Julian, who justified his cause by indulging his passions. Does the assassin of my family reproach me that I was left an orphan? He urges me to revenge those injuries which I have long studied to forget. The assembly was dismissed, and Leonis, who with some difficulty had been protected from the popular fury, was sent back to his master with an epistle in which Julian expressed, in a strain of the most vehement eloquence, the sentiments of contempt, of hatred, and of resentment, which had been suppressed and embittered 
or the dissimulation of 20 years. After this message, which might be considered as a signal of irreconcilable war, Julian, who some weeks before had celebrated the Christian festival of the Epiphany, made a public declaration that he committed the care of his safety to the immortal gods, and thus publicly renounced the religion as well as the friendship of Constantius. The situation of Julian required a vigorous and immediate resolution. He had discovered from intercepted letters that his adversary sacrificing the interest of the state to that of the monarch had again excited the barbarians to invade the provinces of the West. The position of two magazines, one of them collected on the banks of the Lake of Constance, the other formed at the foot of the Cotian Alps, seemed to indicate the march of two armies. And the size of those magazines, each of which consisted of 600,000 quarters of wheat, or rather flour, was a threatening evidence of the strength and numbers of the enemy who prepared to surround him. But the imperial legions were still in their distant quarters of Asia. The Danube was feebly guarded. And if Julian could occupy by a sudden incursion the important provinces of Illyricum, he might expect that a people of soldiers would resort to his standard, and that the rich mines of gold and silver would contribute to the expenses of the civil war. He proposed this bold enterprise to the assembly of the soldiers, inspired them with a just confidence in their general and in themselves, and exhorted them to maintain their reputation of being terrible to the enemy, moderate to their fellow citizens, and obedient to their officers. His spirited discourse was received with the loudest acclamations, and the same troops which had taken up arms against Constantius when he summoned them to leave Gaul now declared with alacrity that they would follow Julian to the farthest extremes of Europe or Asia. The oath of fidelity was administered, and the soldiers clashing their shields and pointing their drawn swords to their throats devoted themselves with horrid imprecations to the service of a leader whom they celebrated as the deliverer of Gaul and the conqueror of the Germans. This solemn engagement, which seemed to be dictated by affection rather than by duty, was singly opposed by Nebridius, who had been admitted to the office of Praetorian Prefect. That faithful minister, alone and unassisted, asserted the rights of Constantius in the midst of an armed and angry multitude, to whose fury he had almost fallen in honorable but most useless sacrifice. After losing one of his hands by the stroke of a sword, he embraced the knees of the prince whom he had offended. Julian covered the prefect with his imperial mantle, and protecting him from the zeal of his followers, dismissed him to his own house, with less respect than was perhaps due to the virtue of an enemy. The high office of Nebridius was bestowed on Seleust, and the provinces of Gaul, which were now delivered from the intolerable oppression of taxes, enjoyed the mild and equitable administration of the friend of Julian, who was permitted to practice those virtues which he had instilled into the mind of his pupil. The hopes of Julian depended much less on the number of his troops than on the celerity of his motions. In the execution of a daring enterprise, he availed himself of every precaution as far as prudence could suggest, and where prudence could no longer accompany his steps, he trusted the event to valor and to fortune. In the neighborhood of Basel he assembled and divided his army. One body, which consisted of ten thousand men, was directed under the command of Navita, general of the cavalry, to advance through the midland parts of Raetia and Noricum. A similar division of troops under the orders of Jovius and Jovinus prepared to follow the oblique course of the highways through the Alps and the northern confines of Italy. The instructions to the generals were conceived with energy and precision to hasten their march in close and compact columns, which, according to the disposition of the ground, might readily be changed into any order of battle, to secure themselves against the surprises of the night by strong posts and vigilant guards, to prevent resistance by their unexpected arrival, to elude examination by their sudden departure, to spread the opinion of their strength and the terror of his name, and to join their sovereign under the walls of Sirmium. For himself, Julian had reserved a more difficult and extraordinary part. He selected 3,000 brave and active volunteers 
resolved, like their leader, to cast behind them every hope of a retreat. At the head of this faithful band, he fearlessly plunged into the recesses of the Marcian, or Black Forest, which conceals the sources of the Danube, and for many days the fate of Julian was unknown to the world. The secrecy of his march, his diligence and vigor, surmounted every obstacle. He forced his way over mountains and morasses, occupied the bridges or swam the rivers, pursued his direct course, without reflecting whether he traversed the territory of the Romans or of the barbarians, and at length emerged between Ratisbon and Vienna, at the place where he designed to embark his troops on the Danube. By a well-concerted stratagem, he seized a fleet of light brigantines, as it lay at anchor, secured a supply of coarse provisions sufficient to satisfy the indelicate but voracious appetite of a Gallic army, and boldly committed himself to the stream of the Danube. The labors of his mariners, who plied their oars with incessant diligence, and the steady continuance of a favorable wind, carried his fleet above seven hundred miles in eleven days and he had already disembarked his troops at Benonia, only nineteen miles from Sirmium, before his enemies could receive any certain intelligence that he had left the banks of the Rhine. In the course of this long and rapid navigation, the mind of Julian was fixed on the object of his enterprise, and though he accepted the deputations of some cities which hastened to claim the merit of an early submission, he passed before the hostile stations which were placed along the river, without indulging the temptation of signalizing a useless and ill-timed valor. The banks of the Danube were crowded on either side with spectators, who gazed on the military pomp, anticipated the importance of the event, and diffused through the adjacent country the fame of a young hero, who advanced with more than mortal speed at the head of the innumerable forces of the West. Lucilian, who with the rank of general of the cavalry, commanded the military powers of Illyricum, was alarmed and perplexed by the doubtful reports which he could neither reject nor believe. He had taken some slow and irresolute measures for the purpose of collecting his troops, when he was surprised by de Goliaphus, an active officer whom Julian, as soon as he landed at Bononia, had pushed forward with some light infantry. The captive general, uncertain of his life or death, was hastily thrown upon a horse and conducted to the presence of Julian, who kindly raised him from the ground and dispelled the terror and amazement which seemed to stupefy his faculties. But Lucilian, who had no sooner recovered his spirits, than he betrayed his want of discretion by presuming to admonish his conqueror that he had rashly ventured with a handful of men to expose his person in the midst of his enemies. "'Reserve your master, Constantius, these timid remonstrances,' replied Julian, with a smile of contempt. "'When I give you my purple to kiss, I received you not as a counselor, but as a suppliant.' Conscious that success alone could justify his attempt, and that boldness only could command success, he instantly advanced, at the head of three thousand soldiers, to attack the strongest and most populous city of the Illyrian provinces.' As he entered the long suburb of Sirmium, he was received by the joyful acclamation of the army and people, who, crowned with flowers and holding lighted tapers in their hands, conducted their acknowledged sovereign to his imperial residence. Two days were devoted to the public joy, which was celebrated by the games of the circus. But early on the morning of the third day, Julian marched to occupy the narrow pass of Suchi, in the defiles of Mount Hamus which, almost in the midway between Sirmium and Constantinople, separates the provinces of Thrace and Dacia by an abrupt descent toward the former, and a gentle declivity on the side of the latter. The defense of this important post was entrusted to the brave Navita, who, as well as the generals of the Italian division, successfully executed the plan of the march and junction which their master had so ably conceived. The homage which Julian obtained from the fears or the inclination of the people extended far beyond the immediate effect of his arms the prefectures of italy and illyricum were administered by taurus and florentius who united that important office with the vain honors of the consulship and as those magistrates had retired with precipitation to the court of asia 
Julian, who could not always restrain the levity of his temper, stigmatized their fight by adding in all the acts of the year the epithet of fugitive to the names of the two consuls, the provinces which had been deserted by their first magistrates, acknowledged the authority of an emperor who conciliating the qualities of a soldier with those of a philosopher, was equally admired in the camps of the Danube and in the cities of Greece. From his palace, or more properly from his headquarters of Sirmium and Nasus, he distributed to the principal cities of the empire a labored apology for his own conduct, published the secret dispatches of Constantius, and solicited the judgment of mankind between two competitors, the one of whom had expelled and the others had invited the barbarians. Julian, whose mind was deeply wounded by the reproach of ingratitude, aspired to maintain by argument as well as by arms the superior merits of his cause, and to excel not only in the arts of war, but in those of composition. His epistle to the Senate and people of Athens seemed to have been dictated by an elegant enthusiasm, which prompted him to submit his actions and his motives to the degenerate Athenians of his own times, with the same humble deference as if he had been pleading in the days of Aristides before the tribunal of the Areopagus. His application to the Senate of Rome, which was still permitted to bestow the titles of imperial power, was agreeable to the forms of the expiring republic. An assembly was summoned by Tertullus, prefect of the city, the epistle of Julian was read, and, as he appeared to be master of Italy, his claims were admitted without a dissenting voice. His oblique censure of the innovations of Constantine and his passionate invective against the vices of Constantius were heard with less satisfaction, and the Senate, as if Julian had been present, unanimously exclaimed, Respect, we beseech you, the author of your own fortune. An artful expression, which according to the chance of war, might be differently explained, as a manly reproof to the ingratitude of the usurper, or as a flattering confession that a single act of such benefit to the state ought to atone for all the failings of Constantius. The intelligence of the march and rapid progress of Julian was speedily transmitted to his rival, who, by the retreat of Sapor, had obtained some respite from the Persian War. Disguising the anguish of his soul under the semblance of contempt, Constantius professed his intention of returning into Europe and of giving chase to Julian, for he never spoke of his military expedition in any other light than that of a hunting party. In the camp of Hierapolis in Syria, he communicated this design to his army, slightly mentioned the guilt and rashness of the Caesar, and ventured to assure them that if the mutineers of Gaul presumed to meet them in the field, they would be unable to sustain the fire of their eyes and the irresistible weight of their shout of onset. The speech of the emperor was received with military applause and Theodotus, the president of the Council of Hierapolis, requested with tears of adulation that his city might be adorned with the head of the vanquished rebel. A chosen detachment was dispatched away in post-wagons to secure, if it were yet possible, the pass of Suchi. The recruits, the horses, the arms, and the magazines which had been prepared against the sapper were appropriated to the service of the Civil War and the domestic victories of Constantius inspired his partisans with the most sanguine assurances of success. The notary, Gordentius, had occupied in his name the provinces of Africa. The subsistence of Rome was intercepted, and the distress of Julian was increased by an unexpected event, which might have been productive of fatal consequences. Julian had received the submission of two legions and a cohort of archers, who were stationed at Sirmium, but he suspected, with reason, the fidelity of those troops, which had been distinguished by the emperor, and it was thought expedient under the pretense of the exposed state of the Gallic frontier to dismiss them from the most important scene of action. They advanced, with reluctance, as far as the confines of Italy, but as they dreaded the length of the way and the savage fierceness of the Germans, they resolved, by the instigation of one of their tribunes, to halt at Aquilae, 
and to erect the banners of Constantius on the walls of that impregnable city. The vigilance of Julian perceived at once the extent of the mischief, and the necessity of applying an immediate remedy. By his order, Jovinus led back a party of the army into Italy, and the siege of Aquileia was formed with diligence and prosecuted with vigor. But the legionnaires, who seemed to have rejected the yoke of discipline, conducted the defense of the place with skill and perseverance, invited the rest of Italy to imitate the example of their courage and loyalty, and threatened the retreat of Julian, if he should be forced to yield to the superior numbers of the armies of the East. But the humanity of Julian was preserved from the cruel alternative, which he pathetically laments, of destroying or of being himself destroyed. And the seasonable death of Constantius delivered the Roman Empire from the calamities of civil war. The approach of winter could not detain the monarch at Antioch, and his favorites durst not oppose his impatient desire of vengeance. A slight fever, which was perhaps occasioned by the agitation of his spirits, was increased by the fatigues of the journey, and Constantius was obliged to halt at the little town of Mopsuquine, twelve miles beyond Tarsus, where he expired, after a short illness, in the forty-fifth year of his age and the twenty-fourth of his reign. Julian thus became master of the Roman world. 